Okay, we are towards the end of the course and I would like to give you um, a summary of the coverage of what we did so far. We started off with an introduction to the course, a discussion of how uh, inspired by the human brain um, we can evolve AI based models and algorithms towards these. So, we discussed models of uh, a neuron, the mathematical model and also uh, we can in, we can enhance these models towards biophysical models, realistic biophysical models. We discussed neural communication, uh, neural networks as directed graphs and how we can evolve neural network architectures uh, both feed forward and uh, feedback based depending upon uh, our learning mechanisms and knowledge representation. Uh, then we discussed learning processes, learning tasks right which is supervised, unsupervised and then reinforcement learning. Then we started off with the basics of uh, perceptron discussed uh, both online learning and um, batch learning and we discussed the convergence proofs of uh, the algorithms. Then we discussed um, regression topics, we looked into modeling through um, regression uh, where we covered both linear and logistic uh, regression for multiple classes. Then we moved on to uh, the multilayer uh, perceptron, derived the back propagation algorithm from first principles um, and then looked into this problem which is the XOR problem and, and then um, we discussed how this can be solved using the uh, multilayer perceptron in which in this case uh, used a single layer of um, hidden neurons as against what we could not do using uh, a simple perceptron. And then we discussed the role of Hessian in online learning along with annealing and optimal control of the learning rate. We moved on to approximation of functions, ideas towards cross validation, network pruning and complexity regularization um, leading to uh, notions of convolution uh, networks. Proceeding further, we discussed Covers theorem. This is a very important result uh, that leads towards pattern separability and then we discussed the interpolation problem that led uh, to the RBF networks or radial basis function networks and we also discussed the kernel regression and relationship to RBFs. Then we discussed extensively the ideas behind support vector machines constructing optimum hyperplanes for linear separability that in some sense maximizes the signal to noise ratio metric uh, for uh, you know the two class problem. Then we looked into extensions uh, of this for design of kernel machines, we revisited the XOR problem and that led us towards robustness considerations to the regression problem. So, continuing on with the SVMs, uh, we looked into the representer theorem and related discussions which led us uh, to the introduction to regularization theory. We discussed the conditions for well postness, specifically Hadamard's condition for well postness. We discussed taken of regularization, evolved regularization networks using you know Green's functions basically we have these Green's networks and we also discussed the generalized RBF uh, networks. Proceeding further because it was in tune with uh, the sparsity constraints, uh, we looked into the basics of L1 regularization, looked into algorithms and extensions and uh, towards the last set of topics we discussed the Hebbian based principal component analysis, kernel based PCA, kernel Hebbian algorithm and, and then some qualitative discussion into um, 
uh, deep auto encoders, stack denoising uh, auto encoders and along with uh, a discussion along with the derivation of the convolution neural networks. So, it is an extensive um, coverage at the introductory graduate level um, course in neural networks uh, and learning systems. So, I hope you have benefited uh, from this. So, the key towards the course is basically uh, your homeworks and programming exercises that will reinforce your understanding uh, into the concepts. So, we are towards the end of the course right I, I, I sort of give you a summary of the course coverage. But again what drives this course right one is from the research side other is development or implementation side. So, let me touch upon both of these aspects when I talk about two facets of AI research. So, one of the applications could be to develop ideas towards synthesizing an artificial brain. I mean this is really a grand challenge. This is where it started off in the 1950s when AI took its birth right in the Dartmouth conference in 1956. So, people discussed this was the uh, basic idea towards synthesizing the artificial brain and today almost close to 70 years we are evolved in our tools in terms of algorithmics, circuits and systems and possibly poised at the right step towards these grand challenges. So, this is one of the uh, uh, key research areas. Second would be neurocomputing engines through bio inspired cues and biophysical models. For example, I need an artificial retina or an engine which uh, can replace the olfactory system right. Uh, we cannot just think about a sensory system in itself, but we need to bring in neuro control towards these systems. So, therefore, I think this is a very interesting confluence of biology, mathematics, uh, physics, computing and lot of these applied areas ok. And the second facet of this research, so first is bio inspired um, engineering right bio inspired uh, neural networks or bio inspired artificial intelligence etcetera. The second facet of this research is to develop AI algorithms that are not necessarily biophysical in nature but they can be driven through uh, plausible mathematical models and endowing these uh, models with learning right. We need to learn the parameters of the mo you know through uh, data correlations and uh, data driven uh, statistics. So, the models themselves need not be biophysical in nature they can be well rounded in terms of the mathematical construction right that is also part of AI research. So, one side is the biological side where you take cues from biology and build these systems that can be fed back into biology or possibly develop systems that are bio inspired. The second is you develop algorithms or AI based algorithms specifically which have which are well founded in terms of their mathematical uh, foundations that can lend themselves into algorithms for applications into uh, real life for real life applications ok. This is the other side of research. So, hopefully this introductory graduate level course will provide the foundations towards both of these as you explore the topics. So, towards the last I would like to briefly touch upon ethics uh, related to AI research and its implications uh, to society right. And whatever we do in science will have in uh, some sense a bearing on the society we live in. So, AI based ideas are very powerful and literally everything can be learned from data correlations. This is very important because today we live in the age of data and 
computing, communication, control, these are the three important uh, ingredients in information and communication technologies. And now we bring in data and literally everything can be data learned from uh, data correlations, right. I am surfing the web and depending upon my surf pattern something can be implied from that, some decision can be made from that. So, it is a, it is a very powerful um, thing to basically um, looking through data from an individual or from uh, a group or wherever it is to infer certain things. With this comes issues of biases, security and data privacy of an individual. So, therefore, when we think about policies, public policies uh, driven by um, uh, statistics um, and, and, and uh, with, with having the AI umbrella on top of it, we should be very careful to not really give too much uh, importance to biases. There could be biases because of statistical, um, because of statistics, right. It is basically the mean of a population, but that does not imply that an individual is, is, is that. Similarly, data and security privacy can be uh, very important tasks because uh, we do not want um, this data to be leaked to um, uh, people or bots that ought not to get this data and individual uh, data privacy has to be respected. Now, when we think about uh, weapons of mass destruction etcetera that are very detrimental to life on earth, I think AI guided weapons of mass destruction can be very harmful to life on earth and therefore, this is something uh, that is very important when one thinks about research towards policies and regulations. Last but not the least, we are in the age of bots and I think in 10 to 15 years this would be a reality that bots can be very much part of um, our, uh, our system right. From restaurants uh, to corporate houses we may see bots that uh, supplement uh, human, uh, human population. While bots can supplement human efforts over mundane tasks as well as offering a high level of expert advice into control and decision making, being a slave to bots can have serious repercussions. So, we agree that like humans um, that are possibly slow in, in control and decision making or computing, bots can be tremendously fast. Right. We, we can process things in parallel and we do in a parallel and distributed manner, but bots can do orders of magnitude faster computation that can lend itself to decision making etcetera. So, this is very important and useful for us, but we cannot become slaves to the decisions from these bots. I think this is an important uh, takeaway advice. So, I think a few perils associated with um, uh, these AI based uh, uh, you know I would say development or, or the evolution um, in, 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 in our uh, societal framework. So, these days people are talking about AI based game addictions right and teenagers and kids uh, they get addicted towards these virtual games uh, etcetera and that is again being slave uh, to these bots and I think these should not. Uh, be encouraged or I think it should be done in a controlled way or a phased manner. Uh, one cannot become addict addicts to, uh, to these uh, AI based games. And then there is an increasing dependence of bots for routine household uh, course. I mean we have bots that can mop, that can uh, cook uh, and possibly even strike a dialogue uh, with an individual over dinner etcetera. But I think we are sort of going away from uh, how we lived in, in, in society and this is an important thing, right. I think having an interesting conversation over a family dinner with humans I think is much more worthwhile than possibly emoting with a bot as to how you spent your day and, and what you did etcetera, etcetera or possibly cooking, right. I mean uh, some routine task of course, uh, bots can help us do this, but I think there is still a joy of doing things yourself, uh, maybe watering the plant, let a 
let it plant grow. I mean, unless you are managing a huge yard or uh, things like that, which requires automation. But I think um, mundane tasks, which I think humans have done, and sort of which is pleasurable, I think those things cannot be replaced by bots. So I think these are some implications. Um, I think uh, that one needs to. I think this is not a general statement. I think this has to be custom uh, made towards each individual. Uh, while you have the power of AI, while you have the power of using the bots, I think uh, one cannot be become increasingly uh, a slave to these uh, to these bots. With the completion of uh, all the lectures, I would like to take a few minutes of your time to introduce the people behind uh, this course. Of course, I am the instructor for this course and I was ably assisted by my teaching assistants. So, all of whom um, are my PhD students. On my left is uh, Amrita Machiredi and the middle is uh, Prayag Gaugi and on my right is Zita Sashindran. All the TAs have taken a lot of uh, care to look carefully through the video uh, lectures, uh, help in the editing process as well as uh, taking part in the homeworks and uh, these details. Okay. So, I think I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, them as part of this work. And last but not the least, there is ground staff that have uh, taken care towards recording all these uh, uh, videos and uh, painstakingly being able to accommodate our uh, schedules and I will list their names, they are not here right now. Uh, it is Deepali uh, Saloke, then Danaya Naidu, Avinash and Naveen. So, without whose help we would uh, not be able to uh, complete this journey uh, in creating this uh, MOOC course which is whose effort is really two times the normal effort one can think of uh, in a regular course. So, with this uh, I would like to conclude. Uh, uh, this series of uh, lectures. I hope uh, you enjoy this. Uh, please leave your likes and comments and uh, we will take a note of this and above all I would like you to register uh, to the course and, and, and then uh, really uh, learn through this experience. I wish you all the best.